Remember that girl who got given that special button box? Well, she's back, and so is King for one final go around. Here is my spoiler free review of Gwendy's Final Task. Hi everyone, I'm Dave Musson, at Dave Musson on Instagram. Welcome to my channel. This is the place where I'm always talking Stephen King. Now, usually I spend these videos giving you 19 reasons to read each of his books. I'm going through them in chronological order and have recently made it up to 2000 and his excellent book on writing. If you've not checked out any of those videos before, do click around my channel, see if there's anything you fancy and see what you think. I also put out specials occasionally and I try and do reviews of new books as well, which is what we're here to do today. If you like what you see on my channel and you want more, then maybe consider subscribing so you won't miss any videos in the future. So as you already know by now, in this video, we're looking at a review, a spoiler-free review of the brand new Stephen King book, Gwendy's Final Task, which he has co-authored with Richard Chismar. And if you're watching this video on the day it releases, this book is out today. How exciting, right? So I should say, I didn't get an advanced copy for this review. I'm not that high up the pecking order yet. Although, if anyone from Hodder is watching and wants to change that, you know, get in touch. But as it happens for Gwendy's Final Task, I just pre-ordered it from my excellent local bookshop, Kenilworth Books. And, well, it landed in their store a few days before release, last Friday to be precise, and they messaged me and said my order was ready for collection. And at first I didn't quite believe it, but I went in, checked it out, and came home holding this. And well, that changed my weekend reading plans, and huh, I was done in enough time to record this video for you, ready for this review to drop on release day. So thank you to Kenilworth Books, and hey, support your local bookshop. You never know what treats you might get. So for this video, I want to give you my spoiler-free review of Gwendy's Final Task and just share some of my thoughts about this book with you. I will keep it spoiler-free, but at the very end of the video, I'm gonna do something of an Easter egg hunt where I just pick out, still in a mainly spoiler-free way, some of the interesting little tidbits that I spotted in this book that are references to other King works and other bits from his universe. But I appreciate some of you might like to discover those on your own. So like I do in my spoiler warnings in my usual videos, I will give you plenty of warning when the Easter egg hunt is coming. So if you want to drop out before, you can do. But otherwise, it's a spoiler free review, me sharing what I thought of this book. Does that sound good? Cool. Let's get into Gwendy's final task. So this book is the third in the Gwendy's trilogy. You can see the other two here, Gwendy's Button Box, which the two of them wrote together from 2017, and then Gwendy's Magic Feather, which Richard Chismar wrote on his own in 2019. Now, it's probably worth just giving you a summary of the story up to this point, and actually the synopsis from the inside of this book does that pretty well, so I'm just going to read from it very quickly. So, when Gwendy Peterson was 12, a stranger named Richard Farris gave her a mysterious box for safekeeping. It offered treats and vintage coins, but it was dangerous. Pushing any of its seven coloured buttons promised death and destruction. That's the first book. Years later, the button box re-entered Gwendy's life. A successful novelist and a, and a rising political star, she was once more forced to deal with the temptations that the box represented. An amazing sense of well-being balanced by a terrifyingly dark urge towards disaster. That's the second book. With the passing of time, the box has grown ever stronger and evil forces are striving to possess it. Once again, in this book, it is up to Gwendy Peterson, now a United States Senator battling the early symptoms of Alzheimer's disease to keep it from them at all costs. But where can you hide something from such powerful entities? Gwendy's final task is a wildly suspenseful and at the same time deeply moving novel in which horror giants Stephen King and Richard Chismar take us on a journey from Castle Rock to another famous cursed main city to the MF1 space station where Gwendy must execute a secret mission to save the world and maybe all worlds. So that's your synopsis for the book and it does give you a pretty good grounding of what to expect when you go into this one. And I thought it was useful to start this review with that so I don't have to cobble together some sort of wording for myself when it's all there written for me on the inside of this book. So when I sat down to read this on Friday evening and well, I opened the page to the cover page and saw this rocket that basically looks like the rocket from Wallace and Gromit's A Grand Day Out. Didn't fill me with confidence, let's put it that way. And then I opened up the first page of the story and 
was set in 2026. Um, and this line particularly hit me. The coronavirus is still around, like a party guest who won't go home. And while many fear it may mutate again and render the vaccines useless, for now it's been fought to a draw. I mean, thanks for the downer opening, guys. <sighs> okay. But from then on, it got much better. And for what it's worth, I really, really did, as a headline takeaway, I really enjoyed this book far more than I was expecting to. And it was a really breezy read, despite being over 400 pages long. It took me about five hours to get through it. And I'm not a particularly fast reader. It's just one of those stories that moves at pace and keeps you going. And of course, it's helped by quite a large font and large borders on the pages as well. But, you know, it still was a page turner. In terms of the other two books, I really liked the first one. I thought it did its job perfectly. It did not stay as welcome, was a great story and had a really terrific cast of characters and was just a lot of fun. The second one, which Richard Chisman did on his own, I did feel was a little bit lacking, a little bit flat. And that's not to put the downer on Chisma. He's a great writer and he still builds the characters out here. And there's, there is some good story in there, but the payoff just isn't quite worth it. And it's always difficult when you started something with Stephen King and then he steps away from book two, the pressure on you to try and match that guy must be immense. And King coming back for this one really emphasizes just what a next level writer he is. Richard Chismart is a great writer, but in the hands of both of them, this jumps back to being just that extra level of storytelling nous and just that willingness to hold your hand and take you through and keep you hooked all the way through and give you the payoff at the end. This one, yeah, it really does tick all of those boxes. And I guess that's the first talking point for this really, is King being back. And like I've just said, I don't want to slam on Richard Chismar because he did a great job and he has helped give this project real energy and enthusiasm. But with the two of them back together, and it does really feel like they are enjoying themselves on this, it does just have that extra little bit of polish. And it takes us back to a world, and as I said earlier, a cast of characters who are really worth investing in. So King being back to finish this off really does, really does elevate it up a notch. I mentioned this was a breezy read, as has been the way with the other two books in this trilogy. The chapters are all pretty short, only a few pages long each. And that really does give this one in particular a real sense of purpose and direction as we are heading, racing towards Gwendy's final task to find out what it is she's got to do with this button box and how it's gonna save our world and all the other worlds. It keeps you hooked, keeps you turning those pages and lets you just absolutely fly through it. I'm gonna put that there because otherwise I'm gonna be waving it in front of you for the rest of the video and that'll just get annoying. So ahead of this book being released, the details that came out were around the locations that we were gonna visit. Obviously, we were gonna go back to Castle Rock, that's where Gwendy's from, and that's where the other two books are set. But it also mentioned that second cursed main city, which turns out was Derry, of course, the setting for it, amongst other stories. And the fact that Gwendy was going to go to the MF1 space station. Now, I'm not gonna lie, when I first read these, I did roll my eyes a bit at the idea of Gwendy going into space and I got a little worried about just how contrived that plot might have to end up being to get Gwendy from Castle Rock through to Derry and then on a spaceship up into the stars above the earth. Actually though that part of the book is really well done. We start the story in 2026 with Gwendy on a rocket ready to go on a space mission and the visits to Castle Rock and Derry are done through flashbacks as the rocket is getting closer to the MF1 station, which stands for many flags due to the many countries involved in building the space station. Get your minds out of the gutter, everyone, for those of you thinking of another MF. As Gwendy's getting towards the station, we see more flashbacks and that's where we visit those other cities. So those multiple locations, I guess still a little bit contrived, but actually quite smartly done and they don't distract from the story at all. I'm gonna pick this up again because the other talking point when the cover art came out was, of course, this, the unmistakable dark tower. And, well, it got tongues a-wagging on the internet. Was Stephen King really returning to his first significant piece of dark tower work in years since the wind through the keyhole in a Gwendy's book? A book that he's not even got sole ownership of? Well, that certainly seemed to be the way. Now, the more cynical ones out there probably just assumed that that was a way to hook more readers back in and perhaps try and elevate this book after this probable dip in the second one when King wasn't involved. 
But there are Dark Tower elements in this story, plenty of them. And for my money, for my money, they are done in a way that is enjoyable, that constant readers will get a kick out of without it trying to deflect attention away from the behemoth that is the main Dark Tower story. For those of you who don't know the Dark Tower, I don't think the Dark Tower elements in this will put you off or confuse you too much. They just add an extra sense of weirdness and actually could be a great gateway into discovering the whole Dark Tower epic, if you so wish. And if you want a full guide to the Dark Tower, that doesn't include this because I recorded it before this came out, but if you want a full guide to all of the books related to the Dark Tower, hit the link up there right now and you can check out the one that I made for you earlier. I guess the big question with the Dark Tower stuff is, well, is the climax, is Gwendy's final task going to be her stood in a field full of roses in front of the Dark Tower, staring at Roland with her finger on the big red button in her button box? Well, is it? This is a spoiler-free review, I'm not going to tell you that. I will say again on the Dark Tower stuff, I was still surprised at just how much King and Chisma were willing to lean into the Tower stuff in this, again, in a Gwendy's book. And I guess some people might say that it feels a bit forced and perhaps does do some damage to the wider Dark Tower story. After all, that's this epic fantasy western, and now we're at a point where we've got a US senator in space with a button box. But like I just said, I think it's handled pretty well. It's done in a way that is enough of a nod for constant readers to get a kick out of it, but doesn't, doesn't try and take anything away from Roland and his quartet. I do still think it's a bold move to go into the tower in this particular book. And, you know, looking at the fact that King has this book and Fairy Tale out this year, if I were asked to put money on which one of those two would be a more Dark Tower leaning one, I would have gone for Fairy Tale. And I guess there's still a chance that Fairy Tale will cover Dark Tower stuff, we'll have to see in September. But in short, I feel like I've stretched the point too far here. Yes, there's Dark Tower stuff in here. Yes, for my money, I think it's pretty well done. And no, if you're not familiar with the Dark Tower or you don't like the Dark Tower, it will not ruin your enjoyment of this book. It's worth mentioning Derry as well. You can see I'm wearing my I Heart Derry t-shirt. A potentially another controversial choice to include in this book, given that it's a setting for one of King's, if not his most iconic story, It. Now, if you had visions of Gwendy being chased through the sewers by a demonic clown, don't worry too much. I know this is a spoiler-free review, but I'm going to say she doesn't get chased by Pennywise through the sewers. You don't need to worry about it being as cheesy as that would have come across. Again, the Derry stuff is handled really well because it serves as a reminder of what a fucked up place Derry is and how it's a place that people just do not want to have any involvement with. The sense you get about Derry when you read it in this book is a sense of it being not right, of it being dirty, of it being unsafe, of it being somewhere you want to push away from. That's always been the image of Derry in King's works and it's really nice to get it reminded here. Yes, we go back to Derry, but it is not romanticised at all. It is still a place to stay the hell away from. One last thing on the locations, I guess while we've got King going back to Derry and the Dark Tower in the same book, it does get me wondering, has he got an inkling to do a sequel to it and to do more Dark Tower stuff before he calls time on his career? I mean, I guess we'll find out soon enough, but interesting, isn't it? Again, throwing it in in a Gwendy's book. So we've got to mention that space stuff as well, haven't we? Now, as I said earlier, it could have felt really contrived to get Gwendy into space. The reason she's going into space is because Richard Farris comes back and visits her and says, you've got to get rid of this button box. There's bad people after it. And the only place you can realistically get rid of it safely is in outer space. Now that's a difficult task for most normal people, but Gwendy, as it so happens, is a well-connected senator. She manages to wangle her way onto a space mission. You just have to go with that bit a little bit, but hey, it's a work of fiction after all. Just accept that, accept that she has earned her place on that rocket and it's fine. You can then go with it and enjoy the story. So we know King likes to use pop culture references in his work and there's a couple of things in this that are interesting that he's brought in. Um, I've mentioned the coronavirus stuff on the opening page. And actually, we find out that coronavirus was caused by a previous guardian of the button box, somebody who had taken ownership of it in between Gwendy's second and third stint. Now, actually, that's, that's pretty much the only bit of this book that I don't like. The fact that this global pandemic that has killed millions and millions of people has re been reduced to a character in a work of fiction put, pushing a button on a box kind of feels a, 
bit too soon and a bit too disrespectful, but that might just be me. The other thing I find interesting that has been brought into this is the billionaires going into space in penis shaped rockets fad that has emerged over the course of the pandemic. We've got references to the SpaceX and the Blue Voyager or whatever Richard Branson's one is called. Um, and we have a character who is sort of in the ilk of those kind of men among the crew of the spaceship in this story. But it's interesting that that is brought in because it is done with a bit of a sneer and a plenty of contempt. A couple of other non-spoiler things to mention here. There's lots of 19 references, as you would expect. Do keep your eyes open for those. And there's, as is often the way with King, there's some weird sex stuff going on here. Not sex scenes and stuff, more a reference to the fact that apparently the force of G-force as you go into space gives you a feeling like the best orgasm you've ever had. Kind of didn't really need that line. It was a bit cringy, but hey-ho. So I mentioned earlier about the Jeff Bezos, Richard Branson type character, and that in this book is Gavin Winston, who is a billionaire and he is the main antagonist in this story. And for the most part, he is written in a brilliant way, i.e. you will hate him. He is despicable, he's vile, he's horrible, he's rude, he's racist, he's pretty patronising and sexist as well. And there's some really clever lines in his dialogue that really just get across how much you should dislike him. The fact that in one sentence he goes from addressing Gwendy as Senator to Gwendy to dear, that gives you an idea of what it's like. Gwendy herself reflects this guy, doesn't appear to have the words thank you in his vocabulary. And when he refers to the characters of colour in this, he refers to them as people like you. That's more than enough to make a character who is utterly despicable. The problem is he's also overweight, he's also fat, and of course King lets us know about this. Not to the extent that he has done in previous books, I will give him that, but you know, we didn't need him to be fat to hate him. It's a strange one, but it's kind of one of those habits that King just seems unable to break. Talking of bad habits, I mentioned there are some characters of colour in this, and actually, for a change, their skin colour is not rammed down your face the entire time. It's not their overriding characteristic. Yes, the black character's surname is Black, and the Indian character is named Patel, which is unimaginative. Not great, and neither of those characters are the head of the crew. But for once, they're not there as magical characters, and their skin colour is only brought out through the dialogue of Winston, and it's much later on in the book. It's not bang in your face. So he's getting better. There is an unfortunate line where Richard Farris is talking about one of the previous owners of the button box, who he talks about her having dark skin but being off the white. Again, not really necessary detail, but it does feel like he's at least tried to do better this time, and that's good, I guess. Of course, I can't wrap this review up without talking about Gwendy herself, who remains and continues to be an excellent and eminently likeable character. She is just really good-hearted. She was brought up by her father to do the right thing, and she continues to do that in this book. As I said, you will enjoy spending time with her, you will enjoy being in her head, and the added complication this time around that she's battling early onset Alzheimer's and she's trying to hide that from her crew, that adds an extra level of tension that is surprisingly gripping. You wouldn't think that that simple idea of trying to mask the fact that things are slipping upstairs could add so much tension, but when you're in space and every move matters, I suppose it really does up the severity. The only thing about her that's not really believable is the amount of success she's had in her life, but hey, it's fiction and she's had a magic button box, so just go with it, okay? Overall, I, again, I'm gonna say it, I enjoyed this book a hell of a lot more than I thought I would, mainly because the story is good and Gwendy is such a strong character. I certainly enjoy spending time her way more. Away. I'm certainly happier spending time with her than I am with Holly Gibney, for example. You can really tell that the two men involved in writing this one were having a good time, and it's got that relaxed, carefree feel that the first book had 
of just two story slingers bouncing ideas around from each other and riffing off each other's energy. And it certainly doesn't have any of the nerves that definitely came through in Magic Feather when Richard Chismar was there on his own and had a whole world of constant readers looking on him, like me, I'll admit, and pouncing on anything that wasn't quite right and just picking it apart, mainly because Stephen King wasn't there anymore. It was kind of an unfair amount of scrutiny, really. Even if I still stand by the fact that the story wasn't quite as good in the second one. With the two of them together to finish this off, it's just a much more polished feel and a much more enjoyable end product. For me, this is a solid three and a half out of five and comfortably the second best book in the trilogy. The bits that you might have been nervous about from what you've read ahead of it coming out, actually, for me, are pretty well done. And the story is structured in a way that just keeps those pages moving and keeps you whizzing through towards Gwendy's final task. I certainly had a lot of fun reading it. I breezed through it in far less time than I thought I would. And like I say, it was a bit of a surprising one. I really did enjoy my time in this book. Once you've had your chance to read Gwendy's final task, let me know in the comments what you think of it, because I would love to hear from you. So that's my spoiler free review of Gwendy's final task done. But before I sign out, I just wanted to go through my little Easter egg hunt, which is where I pick out some of the things from other King works that I spotted in this book. Now, I appreciate that some of you will want to discover this for yourself. So this is your warning. If you want to leave before the Easter egg hunt, go now, but don't forget to subscribe if you haven't done so already so you don't miss any future videos and maybe come back again soon. Okay, that's your warning. Let's get into the Easter egg hunt. So a few things to talk about. First of all, the rocket has been provided by the Tet Corporation and we learn of a sinister presence called the Sombra Corporation. Tower junkies out there will know exactly what that refers to. The crew are due to be on the MF-1 space station for 19 days. Gwendy mentions how she imagined Richard Farris should be using a fancy cane with a silver wolf's head as its handle, just like Lenoge in Storm of the Century. Gwendy wrote a book about the Bradley Gang massacre in Derry, which is a story told in It. And when we go to Derry in some of those flashbacks, we hear stories of people being chased by the clown and, and tales that maybe the clown got somebody. Gwendy, as a published author, was published on Viking, which was one of King's early publishers, who he ended up leaving in a dispute over money. But clearly, there's no hard feelings there because he's happy to name drop them in this one. The code to unlock Gwendy's safekeeping box up in the spaceship where the button box is kept is 1512253. 1 plus 5 plus 1 plus 2 plus 2 plus 5 plus 3. You got it. It's 19. Guess who turns up for a significant role in this? The low men in yellow coats. There's also a line how in Derry somebody spots an abandoned old bike. Silver, maybe? Gwendy herself remembers having a Scooby-Doo lunchbox at school, just like Duddits in Dreamcatcher. There's a game of hearts flowing around the care home where Gwendy's father lives. And last of all, the airlock opens out onto space for Gwendy's final task at 0748. 19 again. There you go. So there we go, a spoiler-free review and Easter egg hunt of Gwendy's Final Task by Stephen King and Richard Chismar out today if you're watching this video on the day that it drops. Do check it out, do seek it out, it's a great little read, you'll have a lot of fun with it. And once you're done, come back here and let me know in the comments what you think of it. And don't forget to come back here soon to check out my other videos, maybe subscribe so you don't miss any in the future, and let's carry on our path through the works of Stephen King together, okay? Until then, take care and I will see you very soon.